Good morning. Happy Wit Monday. We've entered Wit Sun Tide. This is the season, if you will. It's not really a season. The time after Pentecost. We're in the octave. This is Monday, June 6th. And it is morning. And I swear all I have in here is coffee. Hmm. I'm Jake Fowler. This is the Paleocrat Diaries. And we're on the meaning of Catholic. We do this about once a week, and by we, I mean me, Ecumenical Councils. This is part 16, if I'm not mistaken, continuing with iconoclasm. I'm going to rehearse what that was. We'll move forward in our narrative and see just how far we get. I have a goal. Let's see if we get there. Before we do, where do we go? Here we go. Check this out. This is Our Lady's Closet. You can find it on Etsy.com. This is my wife's brand new business. Please, please, if you're interested in Catholic dresses for your little girls, consider this as an option. This would be a great way to support me, to support her, and by extension, this apostolate. So again, if you're in the market, go over to Etsy.com, search Our Lady's Closet, and hopefully you find something that you like that will fit. Although I will say she can make pretty much any size. Okay, that's gone. Music, pleasant, but not entirely helpful for our purposes. There we are, outline, check, coffee. Hmm, where were we? Well, if I remember correctly, and I do, because it's right in front of me, we're looking at the year about 726 or 727, whenever Leo the Third, the emperor, the man who is opposite me on the thumbnail, Leo the Third sort of invents, if you will, this heresy of iconoclasm. In other words, the destruction, the refusal of the veneration of images, icons, statues, and so on and so on. Sacred art, basically has to go, according to Leo III. Why was this? Well, perhaps because of the way Leo was brought up. Remember, he was Syrian, he was from the Orient-ish, and that was an area dominated by Monophysites, who rejected images for their own reasons, also by Mohammedans, who rejected images for their own reasons. Whatever Jews would have been left in the Roman Empire, they too would have naturally been influential in the East to, to some degree. And they too rejected images. So Leo III is growing up in this, almost like it's anachronistic to say, but it's sort of like an iconoclastic milieu in his childhood. And by the time he becomes emperor, Rome is falling apart. They're being sieged, besieged by the Muslims on the one side, the Bulgars, the Slavs. They're losing battles. They're really not that impressive anymore as an empire. And Leo looks around for a reason, and this is what he concludes. God is angered because we are worshiping images. And so he says, no more. We're not doing that anymore. Now, iconoclasm and iconodulia, uh, I'll refer to the iconoduls, those who favor the images as such. The iconoclasts and the iconoduls, they were starting from the same theological point, which I think is interesting. They've got at least three things in common. First, they agreed that Christ is the image of the invisible God. Where are we getting this? Colossians chapter 1. From sacred scripture, both iconoclast and iconodule agree that this is correct, that that's understood in the proper way, that Jesus Christ himself is the image of the Father. He who sees me sees the Father. So our Lord says to the Apostle Philip. Secondly, that man is also made in God's image. Genesis 1. So Christ is the image of the Father, we are made in the image of God. Iconoclasts and iconoduls agree on these things. Thirdly, 
that the Eucharist was, in fact, the real presence of Christ, and, obviously, it can be seen. Now, where they differed were the conclusions that are drawn from these premises. On the one hand, in the case of the iconoclasts, they said, well, because of the realities involved with these things, the image of of God on the one hand, and the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist on the other, they cannot be depicted in sacred art because of what the thing is in its very nature. Iconodules claimed the exact opposite. Because divine power is mediated through the sacraments, through material things, therefore they can be depicted in sacred art. So you see how we've got the same principle or the same premises and two differing theological conclusions. What should we do if that were the case? Well, according to uh, Bannister and St. Francis de Sales and pretty much the church for all time, Matthew 18 and all that, we're supposed to take it to the church and let the magisterium hash it out. Now, is that what happened? Mm, I think you know better. Leo III, he don't care. He attempts to impose his new theological outlook on the rest of the church, beginning with his man in Constantinople, the patriarch, Germanus. Germanus was patriarch from about 715 AD to 730, roughly coinciding, almost exactly coinciding, with the reign of Pope Gregory II. In January of the year 730, Leo III summons what's known as a silencium, or in other words, a meeting of senators and other Roman officials, at which this patriarch Germanus was pressured to subscribe to iconoclasm. He was an iconodule. He orients his defense of sacred images from the Incarnation. That, that's what he takes as his starting point. If we are to believe the Council of Ephesus, if we are to believe the Council of Chalcedon, that God became man, and that this person of Christ has two natures, then it seems that he himself desired to be depictable. I don't know a single human on earth who can't be depicted. We're bodily. Bodily things have extension in space. We have color. We have depth. And all of these things, however imperfectly, can be translated into art. So it seems to Germanus that if Christ truly did become man, that he was okay with being depictable, circumscribable. And furthermore, he says, the intention of the person bowing down to an image, praying before a statue, mounting a crucifix on their wall, is not to adore the material thing itself, but rather to call to mind the reality of which the image reminds us and to offer to that person worship or veneration. Leo III was not having it. The Silencium, the other officials there, they basically gave him an ultimatum. He's about 90 years old. He refuses to submit to the emperor's decree, and he was allowed to retire. In other words, he was deposed. One of my sources say that he was put to death. The other one says that he wasn't. So, not sure. It seems like he was just left on his own in the imperial palace. Just don't bother anybody anymore. With Germanus out of the picture now, Leo III needs to fill his spot, right? We've got Sede Vacante in the seat of Constantinople. So he looks around, and Leo's probably thinking to himself, I need somebody who's going to be really good at this job. And by really good, he means... Someone who's going to do what I say. And he finds him. Finds a man named Anastasius. Anastasius was very amenable to the emperor's ideas. 
And apparently he was able to rally the support of many other bishops as well. Now, when word was sent from Constantinople to Rome, to Gregory II, he refused to acknowledge Anastasius. And he fires off two scathing letters to Emperor Leo III. I have some excerpts here in front of me. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to read them to you. Just a couple of parts. This is from the first letter. So he begins with the normal pleasantries, and he says further down, We write to you as a brother in Christ. Turn back to the truth you have forsaken. Throw off your pride. Give up your views. Notify everyone by every possible means that you want to correct the scandal and blindness you have caused people, which your insensitivity prevents you from recognizing. That's pretty stern language from Gregory II to Leo III. I think there's a lesson there for us, too. When we are obstinate in our own ideas about what is or isn't a matter of faith and morals, and the magisterium comes back to try to correct us, that's what they'd be saying. That's what they could be saying. Francis doesn't usually do it like that, but he certainly could. He could say, turn back from your obstinate and insensitive ways. Embrace our magisterium. Our meaning the entirety of the church. If you're one of these guys who looks for a break here, a rupture there, a loophole at the third place, you're doing it wrong. Another portion of this same letter, this is the first from Gregory II to Leo III. He says, give up, I beg you, these mistaken opinions, and you will avoid the reprobation of all the world, for even small children laugh at you. Walk into a schoolroom and tell the students, you are the one who destroys the sacred images, and they will hurl their tablets at your head. What you refuse to learn from the educated, learn from simple little children. So again, he's reproving Leo III. This is a correction by a lawful superior. Leo would have done well to listen. Nonetheless, the first letter doesn't get the results that Pope Gregory II is looking for. In other words, the recantation, the repentance of the emperor. So he sends a second. This one, yes, here it is. An excerpt from the second letter. Dogma is the concern, not of emperors, but of bishops, because we have received the mind of Christ. He's quoting 1 Corinthians here. Teaching doctrine is quite another thing from planning to govern the world. The administrator's mind is coarse, rough, and fit for war. It is not suited to the subtleties of dogma. I am writing you about the differences between the palace and the church, the emperor and the bishop. Try to understand this and seek salvation, not further conflict. So again, he's bringing up the fact that Leo III is obstinate in a heresy. He's a public Heretic. He's been corrected to no avail. All of us could be addressed this same way when we commit the errors of Leo III. Now, let's be fair. Most of us don't actually go that far. We don't manifestly commit heresy, most of us. But in the privacy of our own homes, amongst our close friends, at work, perhaps, are we saying things? Are we believing things that are contrary to the faith, contrary to the magisterium? Abandon them. Abandon them. Or what does Matthew 18 say? That the church is to treat us as if we were a heathen and a tax collector. Gregory II died in 731, just a year after Germanus resigned, resigned. Gregory III 
is elected Roman pontiff. If I recall, Gregory III is a Syrian. He may have been born in Italy, but it was of Syrian parentage. He may have been born in Syria. The details are a little fuzzy in my memory at this point. Nonetheless, he's not a Western man, and I think that will become important later on. Gregory III continues the policies of Gregory II, firm refusal to submit to the iconoclasm of Leo III. And in November of 731, shortly after he's elected to the chair of Peter, he holds a synod in Rome, synod of bishops. Ninety-three bishops gather, they review iconoclasm, and they condemn it. They excommunicated anyone who destroyed or even despised sacred images. Naturally, because it kind of goes without saying, Naturally, this upset Emperor Leo III. And what do upset emperors do when popes are hmm, not cooperating? Well, if Vigilius and Martin are any indication, and the threats made against Pope Eugene, and the attempt made on Pope Sergius, hmm, let's kidnap the pope. Leo sends a fleet across the Mediterranean, from Constantinople over to Rome. But wait, providence intervenes. There's a calamity in the Adriatic, and the fleet is wrecked. It seems there were some pretty strong storms that prevented the soldiers from reaching mainland Italy. So Leo III instead has to settle for snatching some papal lands he sort of, uh, well, entirely uncanonically and illegitimately removes papal jurisdiction from Sicily, Calabria, and Illyricum, parts of the world that were typically always under Roman jurisdiction. And he gives it to the jurisdiction of Constantinople. He's trying to curry favor with Anastasius. This embittered relations between East and West and I think we can say that this furthered uh, the Great Schism. In hindsight, we can look back and go, yeah, this is another straw on that camel's back. Now, in fairness to the West, I think we ought to pause here. We've been spending a lot of time looking at history in the East. We talk a lot about Rome. We talk a lot about Constantinople. But we haven't really said a ton, anyways, about the rest of Western Europe. Let me take this opportunity to put your fears at ease, or maybe to heighten your fears, depending on how much or how little you like these videos. I will be doing, at some point in the future, a series on Western European Catholicism from uh, the Middle Ages roughly to the Renaissance. I'm not committing to a time frame on that. I'm just saying I know that you know that you'd like to hear about this, and it's coming one of these days. But for now, let's just take a brief look at the Western situation. We have, over these last few hundred years, growth in the Church of England and Ireland. Not the Church of England, the heretical one from Henry VIII, but the Church in England, rather. The missionary efforts that were begun under St. Gregory the Great and St. Augustine of Canterbury, they've, they've borne fruit. The Synod of Whitby, let's see, we could skip that, forget I said that. The decline of the church in Gaul, or roughly modern-day France, sort of coincides with the rise of Catholicism in the British Isles. English and Irish missionaries, now having been evangelized in the previous decades, they return the favor, so to speak. They start coming back to mainland Europe, to the continent, St. Columban, for example, St. Boniface, whose feast would have been yesterday were it not Pentecost, St. Willibrord, all of these are coming from the British Isles to evangelize or re-evangelize people from continental Europe. These are barbarian tribes, typically. St. Columban was apostle to the Franks, Boniface to the Germans, and Willibrord, apostle to the Frisians. 
so they're called. There were others, not just these three, countless others who gave their lives to spread the gospel of Christ. Now, that's on the good side of things. On the not-so-good side of things, you have the continual advance of the Mohammedans across North Africa and up into the Iberian Peninsula. They tore across North Africa in less than 100 years. The Mohammedans reached the Iberian Peninsula, crossing the Strait of Gibraltar, I believe, in 711 A.D. In fact, Gibraltar, the rock and the strait, are named after one of their leaders, Tariq. Uh, I'm, I'm not an Arabic speaker, obviously, but I think it's something like Jubar al-Tariq means the rock of Tariq, Gibraltar, Gibraltariq. You can see how we got that. This invading force conquered Spain in three years, something that had never been done before or since, to my knowledge. But they didn't stop there. They crossed the Pyrenees. They're marching northeast into what is now France. The Muslims took ground for another two decades, right? So they cross over from Africa into the Iberian Peninsula. They're marching up through Spain, cross the Pyrenees Mountains. Now they're in Gaul, France. And for about 20 years, they're just winning victory after victory, taking up more and more territory until finally, in the early 730s, they're almost to the shrine of Saint-Denis, St. Denis, outside of Tours, okay, near Poitiers. The Franks, the most powerful barbarian tribe at this time, they've had enough. Under their leader, Charles Martel, who was mayor of the palace, not actually king, that would come about later, and that's some details for our other series. But under Charles Martel, he rallies his army, the army of Frankish warriors, and they met the Mohammedans in battle outside of Tours. The Franks stood like a wall of ice, and they crushed the invading force so firmly that by the time nightfall and daybreak came the next day, they had advanced upon the Muslim encampment and realized it had been deserted. They fled, and the Franks slowly and steadily pushed them out of France, out of Gaul, back over the Pyrenees, and they are yet to return. Never have, and we pray, never will. This is the battle that earned Charles his surname, Martel. Martel, uh, Latin, Martellus, hammer. This is Charles the hammer, hammer of the Mohammedans. Okay, so that was a brief look at the West. Let's turn our attention back to the East. Leo the Asaurian, hmm, Leo III, the emperor, who, remember, he wasn't from Isauria, actually, he's from Syria. He dies in 740, succeeded by his son, Constantine. This is Constantine V. Constantine V was an able military commander, and he was an able statesman, although he was a bit high-strung and apparently in poor health. His reputation, by the time he takes the throne, his reputation has been tarnished with a couple of ad hominems. For example, he is sometimes referred to as Constantine the Fifth Copronymus, which has something to do with the legend that he soiled the baptismal font while he, when he was a baby. Right? Not a good omen if you're into that kind of thing. The other one that he was sometimes derisively called is Cabellinos, which has something to do with his inordinate love of horses. I will refrain from those ad hominems, but I wanted to put them out there to get a feel for what, for, for you to get a feel for what his contemporaries thought of him. Constantine V, not well remembered by the Roman Empire. He was an iconoclast and much more so than his father, the same father who sent 
the severed head of Justinian to the Pope. And Constantine V is more severe than that. Interesting. During his reign, which goes from 740 to, I believe, 775, he persecutes the Iconodules and he prosecutes uh, this campaign of destroying sacred images, sacred art, icons, statues, etc., etc. Now, within the passage of just a year, Constantine's throne is challenged. The usurper's name was Artabasius. He was a military official from the Armenian province. He marches on Constantinople with his army and is successful in overthrowing Constantine V. When his victory was assured, he had himself crowned emperor by the patriarch of Constantinople, Anastasius, remember, who was appointed in place of Germanus. Artabasius was naturally supported by the Catholics. But why? Well, because Constantine V is iconoclast, he's a heretic, and he's clamping down on us more than his father had. And so, it seems natural to support the other guy. However, Gregory III did not support this usurpation. He valued peaceful imperial succession. Despite his clashes with Leo III, and the future clashes he would have with Constantine, he was firmly against Artabasius stealing the throne. It's unclear if Artabasius was iconodule, iconoclast, neither, didn't care, saw an opportunity and took it, doesn't really matter. Because his, his fatal flaw, if you will, was that he neither captured nor killed Constantine V. The emperor, the true emperor, rallied some troops, and the following year, in 742, he defeats Artabasius in battle, regains his throne, and reasserts his dominance. Artabasius needs to be punished. He was blinded and led through the streets as a warning to others who may get the same idea. And apparently, there's no shortage of these others in the city of Constantinople. This seems to happen all the time. Anastasius, the patriarch, for his part, he was beaten and paraded through the seats, streets while seated rearward on a donkey. Talk about humiliation. This would have been symbolic, in a way, of the imperial authority thinking that they trumped the spiritual authority. The message is clear either way. Do not defy Constantine V. Now, with his empire once more under his control, he went on about his iconoclastic errands. He makes law that you can only depict natural scenes, like hunting, birds, and other animals in nature, like circuses. Apparently, you can depict people having fun in a circus. You can depict hunting. You can depict animals and plants. But you can't depict the saints. You better not depict Our Lady. And we will throw you in prison if you depict Our Lord. One exception the cross. Not a crucifix, but a cross. Anything that didn't fit those descriptions were destroyed. Those who supported that were persecuted and possibly killed. Now, moving forward a few years into the late 740s and the early 750s, there seems to be a weakness opening up in the Mohammedan Caliphate. They suffered their first great loss, they, the Mohammedans, at the hands of Charles Martel and the Franks just about 20 years prior. 
Charles's son, Pepin, de facto ruler of the Frankish kingdom, went on the offensive, as I mentioned, and the Franks slowly pushed them out of southern France for good. In Spain, King Alfonso reclaims lost territory and uses this momentum against the Mohammedans to his advantage. In the Far East, in China, the emperor was starting to take this Mohammedan threat more seriously. And he goes on the offensive in the year 750 near a city called Fergana, which is in the eastern portion of present-day Uzbekistan. So all of these pressures now kind of clamping down on the Mohammedan caliphate. Adding to that, there's internal division. Rivalries are forming. It's human nature, just like we see the sometimes violent succession in emperors, just like we see the intrigue that goes along with the papacy. Well, the Muslims are no different. They've got ambitious people. They've got violent people. They've got people who will sell things, positions, peddle their influence, and so on and so on. So there's internal strife. There's external pressure. Constantine V sees all this happening, and he uses it to his advantage. He decides to attack the caliphate, and he sends an army eastward into what is now Iraq. He didn't do the same in the west, though. He didn't raise a second army or split the army and have some fighting in the West and others fighting in the East. He devoted all of his military resources, all the ones he could spare, to prosecuting this campaign in the Orient. He sent an ambassador to the West. This sort of indicates how Constantinople views its priorities. We only sent an ambassador to the West to try to negotiate with the Mohammedans, but we're sending a full-fledged army to the East to do our will instead. More tension, right? Just like we had with the last emperor seizing papal jurisdiction illegitimately, now we have this emperor who doesn't really seem to care what happens to the Christians in the West. His campaign was at least somewhat successful. He retook many, many lands from the Mohammedans, even recapturing uh, the hometown of his dynasty, his his dynasty, Germanicia in northern Syria. With his successes, however, he tries to force the assimilation of peoples, and he's got this... uh, Not exactly immigration, because he's not bringing in people from the outside, because now they're part of imperial territory, but sort of like a shakeup of demographics. He wants to import people from these fringe areas to the center of the empire, and then that will sort of displace others, and maybe we can get a more even mixture within the Roman Empire. Not a great idea. He in so doing, moved a bunch of Monophysites from the Oriental provinces that had been lost to the Mohammedans right into the heart of the empire. And as we will see, this will have nothing but a negative effect. I think this is a good place to stop. Not as much today... 727 to about 752, 753. We're getting there. We're getting there. I don't want to go too fast. I like it. I want to extend this out. I also don't want to go too slow. We'll cover the Council of Hyaria in the next episode, and we'll get right up to the doorstep of Nicaea 2. After that, we'll look at the aftermath of Nicaea 2 and the eventual death groan of the iconoclastic heresy. All right. That's good for today, though. Don't forget, everybody, support me by supporting my bride at Our Lady's Closet. Find her on Etsy, etsy.com. If you're not interested or you don't have little girls, 
then you can patronize the meaning of Catholic in other ways. Jeremiah's Patreon, Tim's Patreon, don't forget about Kennedy and Luis. Until next time, signing off as we always do, never give up, keep on smiling, and memento mori.